Michael Mando plays Nacho Varga in Better Call Saul. I'm Matt Noble of Gold Derby. And I wanted to ask you, Michael, what was your favorite thing about playing Nacho? Wow. I mean, what a beautiful arc they gave me, you know, to play a character that's breaking good when the whole show is breaking bad. To have that kind of pressure on and that kind of responsibility really is a dream come true. It turned into a dream role for me. Mm. Do you have a favorite scene from the series? Um, I can tell you a couple of favorites from the last season. I mean, right. I put the uh, the final soliloquy at the end where Nacho finally speaks his, his truth to evil. Um, the phone call with his father was a very important moment for me. Um, maybe the gun sequence in episode two. There's a lot of stuff in season in this season that, that were really kind of like uh, climatic, you know, for the character. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about, um, for people who haven't watched uh, Better Call Saul uh, season six, I'd, I'd suggest you probably go watch that before watch the rest of this interview um, because uh, you have a great moment, uh, well, great moment at the end of the uh, third episode where it's the end of Nacho. So how do you feel about, how, well, actually, before I ask you how you feel about that scene, how did you approach that scene as an actor? Well, I mean, it was a it was a monumental scene, and I knew that it was it was you know you don't really know who a character is until the end. It's kind of like doing a painting, and at the very end, you put the final touches and you you let it dry, and you finally realize what you've been doing for six years. And you had to approach, I think, that scene like you would approach anything, uh, which is always about the truth of the moment and what the character is truly fighting for, what his super objective is. Mm -hmm. In this case, he, he's a person who's done a lot of bad choices and he finally wants to do the right thing. And he's willing to sacrifice everything to save his father, who represents sort of innocence and purity in his life. So I think you really have to approach it from that angle, from the integrity of the character. Sorry. That's from the right. It's Vince Gilligan calling me. He's like, oh. don't, don't give out any spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> But you have to approach it from the integrity of the character, always, you know, what, what are they fighting for? What are they standing up for? Mm, yeah. And what, um, what, so how, how did, how were you told that, uh, that about Nacho's end and how did you feel about it? Well, it's this, it's this call that every actor gets, you know, it's one of those kind of like, um, career defining calls when you get the job and when it's coming to an end. In this case, I was lucky enough. It was at the end of the series at the end of this whole Breaking Bad saga. I received a call from Melissa and Peter and Vince Gilligan. And they said to me, brace yourself. You're going to have a tour de force performance and you're going to have your feature film experience inside of the series. And that it was going to be excruciatingly, excruciatingly physical, emotional, psychological and spiritual. And it, it really was, and I was so lucky to have um, the opportunity to play such an immersive character and such an immersive experience. Mm. Yeah, and you are, uh, as you say, very lucky that it was near the uh, end of the series run, so you got to play out this character over multiple years and be a part of every season of the show. Uh, was it a bit hard sort of leaving and there's still being a few episodes to go so sort of saying goodbye and everyone a few of the others were still sticking around well surprisingly it was very celebratory you know the the crew had showed up with nacho shirts and they had teardrop tattoos and armbands and it was just like such a the character meant so much to so many people you know it, it was really about a guy who was fighting against impossible odds he was caught in between these two corporate sort of sociopathic families and it was just like man versus corporation and um the character came to mean so much to so many people and he he exited on such a celebratory high note where he gets to maintain his integrity that i think it was a celebration for me and the crew mm. and what was making this show like for you in terms of the community uh amongst the other actors and the way that you guys collaborated to tell this story it was a dream come true, you know, I, I had the opportunity to learn so much on all the levels of show business. You know, I, I learned from producers and directors and writers and actors. I learned from the crew. 
um, from the costume department, from the makeup department. It was really, I would, if I was to define it in a few words, I would say it was a, um, it was like writing your thesis in the cinema television world, you know? Yeah. And what did, uh, so what was it like playing a character? Because I think one of the interesting things about Nacho is that some of the characters in Better Call Saul, we've never like, uh, we'd never met before this series, you know, people like Kim, people like Chuck, other characters like uh, Saul and Mike and Gus we've seen before in the Breaking Bad world. You're a character that we, or Nacho is a character that we didn't see in the Breaking Bad world, but he was mentioned briefly in the Breaking Bad world. It was it like playing a character that like sort of, we had some sort of, um, hint of where it might lead but there was still like so many blanks that it was pretty much was a blank piece of paper well it was amazing you know it was a roller coaster ride because you you had no idea how it was going to go you you didn't know what those words and that, you know when he's mentioned in breaking bad you didn't know what it meant so it was like the whole thing was so thrilling you're riding a roller coaster ride and you have no idea when it's going to turn and you don't even know where it's going to end up. You just know that the impact of the character is so strong that a couple of years later, he's still on the minds of the people in this underground world. And it was just so thrilling, you know, and the, the, the challenge of the character was to reduce acting to the essence of being, you know, there was a lot of scenes with very, very little dialogue. So that was another really beautiful challenge. There was no safety net and you just had to really be in the moment and the camera was capturing every micro reaction every every state of being and um especially in, in this season where you had like almost 10 minute stretches without any dialogue how do you think you michael changed over the course of the series like you know how how are you a different actor and person on that day when they yelled cut on that final uh final day shooting that third episode to how you were at the very beginning coming into work your first day on the show. Oh, wow. Now you're, now you're talking my language. Now we're talking existential questions. <laughs> um, you know what? I've learned a lot of things. Um, when, you, when you do a show over the period of six years and your, your emotional reality is captured on camera, you can point to a certain season, a certain time in the season and say, this is when I was going through this. This is when I was going through that. This is how I used to think the world was and, and et cetera. So that's the great thing about it. I would say if I was to put it in a nutshell, I've learned that life is both very hard and very beautiful and that you needed to learn to bring along the ride, the, the crew and, and your environment. You need to find a way to, to motivate the people that are, you know, uh, picking up the lights and micing you up and doing the 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 makeup and 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 um, the grips and the and the the um, transpo department and the props department and all that kind of stuff. You need to find a way when you're in front of that camera, especially if you're called upon to lead the action of of an episode or of a scene or whatever, to find a way to get all these people involved, to get them included, to get them motivated, and you do that um, by genuinely being incredibly grateful to what you have and by giving your all and coming from a place of love and showing them that this is meaningful and, and why it's meaningful. And, and hopefully that will make up for the 13 hour days, you know? Yeah. You had some incredible scene partners over the course of uh, your run on the show. Um, how did you guys as actors look to sort of serve each other as you were building scenes? You know, I have a philosophy that there isn't a moment that I don't give everything, you know, um, whether I'm on camera or off camera. I'm a firm believer that for a scene to be great, everything needs to be great. Every department needs to be great and every actor and every performance needs to be great. So I think that's the philosophy is, is that you get, you want everybody to shine because the, the more everybody shines, the brighter the scene, the brighter the scenes 
the brighter the episodes, the brighter the episodes, the brighter the series, the brighter the series, the more everybody wins, including the audience. So that's, I think, my philosophy. Mm. Do, do, is there a particular day you have uh, working on the show, other than maybe your last day, uh, which was uh, obviously quite memorable, but any other days working on the show that you can just remember very fondly? Oh, God. You know, I, I don't remember specific days, but I remember a, a, a general mood. I remember yeah. coming out of the Netflix studios, a stage four, and then we had this uh, the Sandia Mountains and the sun would be setting. And the, they call them Sandia Mountains because when the sun sets, it hits the mountains and it looks uh, pink. And um, they call them watermelon, watermelon um, mountains. I just remember that feeling, you know, of the of the desert wind rushing over me a day's work in the can and um, this incredible sunset and, and going, God, I'm making movies for a living. And uh, just that sense of gratitude. That's, that's the, how I would define the, um, that experience in a nutshell. Yeah. Is, is it weird not to be going back to Albuquerque? <laughs> you know what? I've traveled so much in my life. I'm, I'm very good at goodbyes. Okay. I don't, I'm not the type of person that misses things very much. I'm always looking into the future. I'm fond of it. I love the crew. So, mm-hmm. you know, the chances of me going back and working there, I think are very probable. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Is it, you say you, you're good at like sort of goodbyes and things. Is there something about that experience that you will particularly miss? Um, miss... Not really, you know, I mean, like, I think I, I've, like, I got moved around so much in my life. Yeah. And I've seen my father pass away last year. And I realized life is so temporary. And you don't want to live in that place of missing something because it's such a, it leaves such a hole, you know, you want to celebrate things. So I don't think I would miss anything. I just feel grateful. You know, I feel mm. grateful and responsible. It feels like I've got all these tools now. And I can't wait to apply them on the next thing. I think that's where my mind state is at. Gratitude and responsibility. Yeah. And what's, what, what is one of those tools that you picked up from Better Call Saul that you're going to use on the next thing? Well, the first most important one is the one I mentioned. It's, it's finding a way to leadership requires that you find a way to motivate the people around you. I mm-hmm. think that's really an important thing that I've realized that it's not about just, I used to come to set and I used to be so focused on my character. And, and I thought if I did that right, then that, that was my job. But as your responsibility grows on a set and you become sort of, you become a, a leading actor, you realize, no, it, it takes a lot more. You got to find a way to motivate the crew. You got to find a way to make everybody comfortable. You have to protect the people that are not being treated fairly. You have to stand up for what's right. So that would be the biggest thing. And that's a philosophy and it's a lifestyle that I'm, learning to do in my business with my publicists with my managers and agents and all that and people you you know you write with and all that stuff if i had to pick another lesson i would re i think everything that comes from a place of love tends to have a better result those mm-hmm. two things i i would say are very strong lessons that i've learned yeah and speaking about sort of lessons better call saul is it does a lot of things like at times it's an action show at times it's incredibly sort of funny and ridiculous as jimmy's on some scheme but like it's also like a, a in some ways a large-scale sort of morality play like a what sorry like a, a, like a morality tale right. um like yeah exploring exploring morality and explore t- sort of teaching lessons what do you think better call saul is trying to teach or what could someone learn from watching better call saul well, that's a again. It's it, it's a big it's a big question, and I love it um, to try to answer it in a, in a soundbite is <laughs> kind of is, is is a challenge. But I can say it's a show about first and foremost. It's, it's about the law, lawyers, the law, and it it juxtaposes the law with what is moral and what is just. And we realize that what is moral and what is just and what is the law rarely go hand in hand, and they can be bend and bent in very, very drastic ways. I play a character who is on the outside of the law. So on the, when you first meet him, he is not necessarily a good guy. But as you get to know him, you understand that his motivation is as pure as it can get because the thing that he is fighting for, his father, 
is sort of like a saint-like figure. And that is when you realize that our humanity is deeper than our administra administrations, our, mm -hmm. our, our lawyers, our, our justice books and all that stuff. Our humanity is, weighs, I think, a lot heavier. And that's why people responded, let's say, to Nacho, you know, the way they did and, and why it was such a, a big deal. You know, historically, like the, the records we broke on that episode were really important. And I think it's because people resonate with humanity more than they do with admin, administrative, uh, you know, jumbo, whatever you call it, jumbo lingo, you know. Yeah. Do you, how much of yourself do you bring to this character? Well, I, I, I think I have a philosophy that it's impossible to escape yourself, no matter how hard you try. You can improve yourself, you can stretch yourself, but you're always yourself. Even when you're playing another character, you're, you're playing versions of yourself. The good news is, I think we're all the same in some way, meaning that I feel we all have the empathy to understand each other and to truly understand each other. So I would say uh, you're, always, you're always yourself, but we're all the same. So that's, it's kind of like a catch 22. We can all play each other. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when talking about some of your like sort of um, favorite moments of this season, you talked about the phone call of his father. There's also um, a great sort of phone call that your character has with, um, with Mike and Gus calling to sort of negotiate or, or to talk about the situation. Uh, how is how, how do you approach a scene like that where you're um, having to give quite a, um, a, a, a big performance, but the counterparts aren't in the room with you acting? Like, you've got to sort of just do it into a phone. You know, I've learned, the, I've learned the thing that, that broke me into in the, in the international scene is a monologue that I did called The Definition of Insanity in a game called Far Cry 3. It went viral and it had, within a week, it had garnered over five to seven million views. I can't remember exactly the amount in that amount of days, but, and it ended up being a, a, a big thing. And I played that monologue to a tennis ball. There was nobody else in the room with me. So I learned, I think, from the theater to, to use yourself um, so the, those phone calls, it's funny, you're right, there was nobody in the room, I was playing to an ex, I had the AD off camera reading the lines, didn't sound anything like the characters, <laughs> but I think once you are uh, anchored in the, in the integrity and in the, in the objective of the character, um, it, it, comes, it comes out of your, your, your it, it just feels like it comes out of everywhere, it doesn't have to you don't always have to have a scene partner. And that soliloquy at the end, actually, when the camera starts panning in, it's the same thing. There was an X, and there was nobody really to look at behind the camera. I had to play off of myself. But again, you know, you and the characters are so great that you can imagine them. They don't, you, you know what they're going to do. And so I don't know if that answers the question or, or yeah, not. No, it does. I feel like it was a little bit of a slippery slope of, a, of an answer, but. No, it was a good one. Yeah. And, um, I guess like probably easier to play those scenes in season six than maybe a season one when you've had time to get to know those characters and act opposite some of those people in person. Well, I, you know, I think, you know, I don't, I don't approach a scene as easy or hard. You know, I, okay. I approach it as what's the truth of it. And, and the truth is basically second by second, moment by moment. You know, if you think of it as, as a, in a, in a grand way, you'll never be able to get over it for the life of you. But if you just think of it as truthful moments to moments, you realize they're all equally as hard and equally as, as um, easy. You know, you just have to find the truth of it. Sometimes you have to dig in a little bit, sometimes not. The advantage of being fresh is that you are, um, the freshness gives a certain excitement. Mm. And the advantage of knowing the characters that you can get in there faster. So, you know, I, I don't like to think of it in terms of easy or hard. I don't like to put that in my head. I just like to think of what's true, you know. I, I like that. And um, if you were to, Michael, in sort of try to in one word describe what the truth of Better Call Saul is, what word would you use? I can't. It would be hard for me to describe the truth of Better Call Saul, but I could describe the truth of my character. Okay. Um, I would say that it's about a guy who comes to terms that the internal life and the internal truths are superior than the external gains. 
I love it. Well, Michael, we might we might leave. I think it's a great spot to end it on. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. All the best of luck with the upcoming Emmy Awards. For better call Saul, people watching this interview can go to goldderby.com to make your award predictions. And Michael, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me and uh, see you soon.